Hello, everyone. Let's talk about politics and governance. We'll explore how uh, various organizations, various actors, respond to armed conflicts in Africa, with a focus on the European Union today. Our guest, Malta Brozic, is from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He will explain how um, institutions can effectively collaborate in complex conflict situations. Malta, in his study, uh, he identifies four conditions for managing this complexity. And uh, we'll provide some insights into the EU's role in the Sahelian security regime complex, uh, as an example. Malta, welcome to our episode. Yeah, thank you for having me. Malta, before we jump into your research itself, can you explain uh, to us, to our listeners, this concept of regime complexity? Yeah, um, regime complexity um, is around for some time now, but especially I think in the last 10 to 15 years, it got more and more prominent. So the basic idea is that um, it refers originally to regimes, so that means treaties, international law, for example, but these days um, we are focused much more also on the overlap of international organizations like the European Union with the United Nations uh, or, or with the um, African uh, Union here. It basically describes, first of all, a situation of institutional overlap. And um, that is important because uh, we have seen, especially in the security, but also in other fields, that institutions are overlapping more and more, either by membership or um, by action. And you can imagine that, you know, out of this overlap, a lot of questions actually emerge and how cooperation um, is actually organized. So it is um, also a little bit problematic. Mm -hmm. I think it was a good uh, kickoff a bit to help us frame where we're going now. So um, what, so what's the importance of studying as you, stu as you, as you did is a regime complexity in um, conflict situations in Africa. So tell us about the importance of this. Yeah, yeah. well, first of all, I should mention that um, the article that we are referring to is also a co-authored article. So it was not just myself, but um, really Planck as well as Yves Reikes have also contributed to it. And um, the, the, the importance is that once you have like a proliferation of actors in a um, situation that's independent of if it's security or economics or something else, um, of course, the immediate question that comes up is, you know, how do we coordinate all of this, right? And does it make sense? So are we actually making our lives more complicated here because more actors means more coordination, more costs of coordination maybe? Or can we organize it in a way to create more synergies? So uh, pooling, pooling of resources. And in the end, very often we actually um, see both. But this is, I think, the, uh, the biggest question, the elephant in the room. Of course, it seems uh, when I read, read your article uh, that you and your co-author wanted to, uh, so in terms of expectations of your research, you wanted to identify effective governance strategies within regime complexity and to understand how actors can fulfill specific roles within this uh, complex conflict response system. Is this correct? Exactly. So we are a little bit EU centered. So <laughs> the, the big challenge for the EU, but also for yeah. other actors is to, to make sense of the existing um, complexity here. And as the EU is still one of the largest, most capable actors in the security field in, in the Sahel, um, the question emerges then, so what can the EU do to remain an important uh, remain an important actor and work with, not against the existing regime um, complexity? And in this regard, we, we're coming up with like four arguments and we try to um, test them against reality, um, so to speak. And one argument is that um, for regime complexity, uh, the best way of having or maintaining influence would uh, be, for instance, to uh, be a resource hub. And this is where the EU can actually score, I think, the, the highest points. Um, the EU is one of the largest donors here. But it's not just about just giving money out uh, or, or running projects. Obviously, uh, <laughs> much more needs to be done here. Uh, then the second argument would then be that um, you need to, in order for the system to work, uh, a regime complex is an can be understood as a system in its own in its own right. It works best if the different partners um, 
are complementary to one another. So if they can really create um, synergies. So resources spent, are we being a resource hub, but resources also spent for um, creating uh, complementarity. This is where the EU is strong. Uh, in the end, the article um, somehow con um, concludes, but um, that is even not enough. So we do one more step. We don't just look at like, let's say the top level of interaction between the big international institutions um, here in the Sahel. So EU, AU, UN, mm -hmm. um, regional economic communities in Africa. So it's an awful lot of them uh, do, do, do exist in, in addition to individual state actors and groups and so on. But we also go at the local level the implementation side. And this is something that the literature has not done so far. So um, in that regard, we try to add a bit of innovation and we combine also two theoretical frameworks. One is the literature on regime complexity that we already talked about. And the other one is complexity theory. And then we develop two more arguments here that we try to test in the, in the field. And this is the argument that comes up from regime complexity that um, these systems work best if they can self-organize themselves. Now, this is a challenge for the EU. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> because as you can imagine, um, you don't want to uh, just, usually the programs are designed in a way uh, that they support your own goals, more or less as an institution, right? So you have a more, uh, you want to have control over your own resources and how they are, they are spent. If we now say, okay, the best way would actually to um, go more, uh, focus more on uh, system self-organization, that implies that your partners have to have a high degree of independence. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a bit problematic, I think, from the EU's perspective, but we would argue that is extremely helpful for the system uh, as such to, uh, to work. And then the last argument of the four would be um, adaptive peace building. So we are focusing on the Sahel. By the way, this is an enormously large field mm -hmm. um, uh, here, so we can only take a little piece of it um, and explore it. Um, the argument of adaptive peace building is also important because it first links back to complexity theory um, and basically says that, you know, uh, there is not, let's say, the magic bullet that you can fire at the conflict and then it's over. Um, but you have to, for each conflict, uh, find out what instruments and tools are working best. So it's an um, iterative learning process. So the program should not be designed in a top-down manner like we know what's best <laughs> and then we implement it. Okay. But it has to be a trial and error thing. And um, there again... I think the article comes to the conclusion that, yeah, these are the rather weaker points. So um, the EU is not really in that position to to accept that trial and error um, um, situ situation there. But there's an emerging literature on adaptive peace building that we uh, refer to, and that clearly shows that, well, this is actually the way forward. And um, final word here. Um, if we look at how conflict and the Sahel across different countries and communities evolves, uh, I mean, it's not a success story um, from the perspective of international uh, interveners here. So we critically have to rethink our approach there. Okay, um, that's very good. There's a well complex uh, discussion uh, about this. I'm curious to hear about potential policy implications of this research or implications already being put in place. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. And of course, we as academics uh, always use high-flying terms here, but I think there are also very practical messages good. In, um, in it. On the one hand, I mean, keep the good things that are working. I mean, the EU as a resource hub is really like a model that works and keeps you in the game. Um, that's one message. On the other hand, um, I think... It is really that we need a more shift in the mindset of how programs are designed and operated. Um, I know this is hard because institutional cultures change extremely slowly and never quickly. Um, but the adaptive side of designing peacebuilding programs, um, I, I think, is, is like 
the biggest message I think in the um in the article and we are still very far from it so what we have in terms of knowledge is we know an awful lot of instruments on how to build peace but we don't know the exact recipe for each individual conflict and this requires us to again and again learn and start a little bit from um, zero and then build uh, build up knowledge step uh, step by step um, so that would be, um, I think, um, our um, maybe practical um, uh, message here. Okay, and I'm I'm assuming from well from all the the, the findings that you had, and, and now there's uh, policy implications that there's still a lot to find. So let's look ahead at the future. Um, future re research on this topic should be looking at what more actors, more conflicts. Where should we be looking at? Um, I think, and I'm. Uh, I, I start from the perspective um, of the current events, very recent events, <laughs> with, for, for example, France opting out, uh, the peacekeeping uh, operation of the UN also drawing, uh, drawing down uh, at, this, uh, at the one side. On the other side, levels of conflict are still high. So you could look at the indicators of battle death, etc. My worry is that we are opting out and leaving a situation uh, behind that might even get worse in the um, in the future. Um, and I think one um, no, this is the time then also for what lessons should uh, should be learned uh, here. And I, and I think one element, I'm not overclaiming here, but one element is that one really has to endorse and under better understand existing complexities and this means non-linearity lots of actors at different levels actually um and we have to understand that you know you cannot come with a one-size-fits-all approach here mm -hmm. and this again requires more adjustment um and adaptation and learning um from uh, the side of the big international uh interveners here um, there's no guarantee for success in situations of active um, uh, conflict here. So it's always like you 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 are intervening in an extremely difficult situation, which doesn't really um, um, give you any guarantees for uh, for success here. That's that's clear, but there's no reason to give up. I think we still haven't really exhausted the potential of really working with, not against complexity. So complexity should not be used as an excuse for doing nothing uh, here, but it's better to actively engage it that's good uh, looking at a, a positive way of looking at complexity itself and it's not um it's not a problem per se it's actually uh, useful for this is how the, the world is <laughs> exactly, exactly can you provide some uh, additional resources about the topic um i would just like to refer um the viewers to the special issue in mm -hmm. which the article was actually published so um there are i'm not sure maybe 10 or 12 uh, <laughs> quite a lot of articles yes. in it and they uh, focus on different aspects of the eu within regime complexity across different policy areas so i think that provides everyone with a good up-to-date um um, overview of the of the literature and discussions. Of course, we thank you for the promotion. Um, this uh, so this thematic issue is uh, available in the politics and governance website. Right, if you are watching us on the let's talk about politics and governance website for our what uh, listeners on your right, there will be a link to the article and then uh, to the thematic issue. Malta, this is a complex conversation in every sense, so. Let's narrow it down. Let's go to the punchline. If there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk, what would it be? Yeah, Com complexity, complexity, complexity. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, complexity is not the opponent. It's not exactly. the enemy. There's no reason to give up. Uh, mm -hmm. But complexity challenges our thinking. Uh, and um, I think uh, most of us are growing up in um, an environment where we got taught to uh, look for cause-effect relationships and complexity turns it upside down. Um, so that mind shifts. So we should be courageous enough to, uh, to endorse it and, 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 and engage it. Malte, it was a pleasure. For our listeners uh, that are watching us on YouTube, you can find um, the resources and so the article and the issue um, mentioned on this conversation 
on the Let's Talk About Politics and Governance website. You can also listen to this episode wherever you get your podcast. You can subscribe if you scroll down um, in the website. And you can also follow us uh, on Twitter at Cogitatio LTA.